Welcome back to our series, Getting the Big Picture. We've arrived now at session 10, and we are calling this Between the Testaments. Uh, you'll remember that we have two testaments in the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, which is largely the history of God's dealings with the nation of Israel. It was written in Hebrew, with some small parts of it also written in Aramaic, and covers a period of about 4,000 years. The New Testament uh, begins with the story of the life of the Lord Jesus, and then the ongoing work of his church. It was written in the Greek language and covers about 100 years. Again, we've seen that there are 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, for a total of 66 books. But between the Old and the New Testament, we have what we've called 400 silent years. And this is what we want to focus on. Sometimes it's referred to as the intertestamental period between the Testaments. So we'll refer to it by those two titles as we work our way through it. The first question we have to ask is, is this period important because the Bible doesn't directly record what happens during this period. And it would be easy to think that because the Bible doesn't include this historical era that we have no need to study it. However, we want to show that some aspects of this period are actually spoken of in Scripture, but we also want to see how a study of extra-biblical history can throw light on the New Testament, particularly the Gospels. So we call these the 400 silent years. Now, when we say that these years were silent, we do not mean that we know nothing about them. Rather, we believe that God was not speaking authoritatively through prophets during this period. The first century historian, Josephus, a Jewish historian, he wrote, From Artaxerxes until our time, everything has been recorded, but has not been deemed worthy of like credit with what preceded, because the exact succession of the prophets ceased. So jo Josephus believed that these writings were not given by prophets, but they were recorded by their scribes, by their historians, and so we do know what was going on during that period. But it is instructive for us to read this extra-biblical historical narratives contained in books like First and Second Maccabees. Now, again, there are some churches, uh, Catholic Church and the uh, Greek Orthodox Church, for instance, that would include uh, what we refer to as the apocryphal books uh, in their Bibles. Uh, some Bibles refer to them as deuterocanonical, a second canon, a second listing of books. The word apocryphal means that they were hidden. Generally, uh, most evangelical Christians would not include these as part of Scripture, though we do find them instructive for reading and learning from. But the first thing we want to focus on is looking at Daniel's prophecies in the book of Daniel. Now, those who reject the supernatural inspiration of Scripture believe that the book of Daniel is not prophecy because it is too accurate. It too accurately portrays the events of this intertestamental period. And so their argument is it must have been written after the fact. It couldn't have written, been written beforehand. However, God declares that one of the proofs of his superiority to idols is that he alone can accurately predict the future, Isaiah 41, 21 to 26. So what we want to do is just think a little bit about some of Daniel's visions. We don't have time to go into these in a lot of detail, uh, but these are things written by Daniel, recorded by Daniel, that start with Daniel's time and look forward for succeeding generations. We'll see how far that that goes. So the first uh, dream that is recorded is in Daniel chapter 2, and it's a, a vision that was given to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And he was greatly troubled by this dream because he couldn't understand what it was all about. And eventually Daniel was brought forward uh, to give an explanation of it. And what it was that Nebuchadnezzar had seen, and Nebuchadnezzar refused to tell his wise men what he had seen. He wanted to test whether they really were able to know uh, the secret things. Um, and so he wouldn't tell them, but Daniel was able to tell them. And he said that there was this great image, a great statue, and it had a head of gold, and then it had a chest and arms made out of silver. It had belly and thighs made out of bronze. The legs were made out of iron, and then the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay. And so it was this very impressive statue, very impressive image that was seen. 
But then it tells us about a, a stone that was cut out without hands and came and struck this great image on the feet. This whole statue came crashing down as a result, and this stone cut out without hands grew to fill the entire world. So what is the interpretation of these? Well, Daniel explains in Daniel chapter 2 uh, that God is giving him a vision of the future and of the world empires that are going to follow from that time on. And we've put an asterisk here next to head of gold because we are given in Daniel chapter 2 an explanation of what that means. So in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 37, uh, we read that Daniel says, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. And then he tells him that after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And so these things that are being portrayed by this image are representing world empires, and we're specifically told here that this is the Babylonian. Now, again, I would suggest that this stone cut out without hands, again, it's not specifically explained, but I think the significance of the stone being cut out without hands is showing us that this is something that God has made rather than something that man has made. And so the stone cut out without hands is looking forward to the coming of the Messiah and the messianic kingdom that he will establish that will destroy the kingdoms of this world and bring them under the authority of Jesus Christ. So then in Daniel chapter 7, uh, there's another vision, this time given not to a Babylonian king, uh, but being given to Daniel himself. And so Daniel was greatly troubled by the things that he saw, and he recorded the things that he had seen. And so the first thing that he sees is a lion with the eagle's wings. And then there's a bear with three ribs in its mouth, a leopard with four wings and four heads, and then a dreadful and terrible beast. And from that dreadful and terrible beast, it speaks about another horn, a little one, that comes out. And then there is one of the most wonderful messianic passages that comes. Uh, let me read it for you in uh, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. And it says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days, God, was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their kingdom taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And so we believe that this one like the Son of Man, again, that is the name that the Lord Jesus most often took for himself and pointed to this messianic prophecy that was being made, that one like the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days, receiving a kingdom that would never come to an end. And the Lord Jesus is the one who has come to establish that messianic kingdom. But it's important to understand, as we look at these two visions that are being spoken of here, he's talking about world empires. And so it has to do with this world. It has to do with empires. It has to do with this messianic kingdom that will someday come. And it will be an earthly kingdom. It will be a political kingdom over which the Messiah, God's anointed, the Lord Jesus Christ, will reign and bring in 
justice and righteousness and peace. But then there's a third vision that's given in Daniel chapter 8 of a ram and a, a he-goat, a male goat. And the ram tells us that it has two horns, and the male goat has a large horn that is broken off, and then four other horns come up to replace it. And again, we are specifically told in Daniel's uh, what empires these represent. And so in verses 20 to 22 of Daniel chapter 8, we read, The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. And so again, these are things that are going to be taking place during this intertestamental period, this period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, particularly the Empire of Greece is, is kind of the dominant focus of that period. Now, these legs of iron and this dreadful and terrible beast, we are not specifically told what nation that is. We know that the Babylonian Empire is specifically said in Daniel chapter 2. The Medo-Persian and the Greek empires are mentioned by name in uh, chapter 8. But these other two kingdoms are not mentioned by name. And yet we believe that, again, which kingdom followed the Greek Empire was the Roman Empire. But then there also seems to be a gap uh, that, that takes place in the midst of all of this that points forward towards the end times, things that are still distant future from us. And these, I think, be, re refer to a revived Roman Empire, something similar to the power and strength of, of the original Roman Empire. Some connection with it, I don't know what that is going to be, uh, but we believe there is a connection that is being made between that. So these are significant, significant visions that were given uh, in the book of Daniel, and uh, two of them to Daniel himself. But then in Daniel chapter 9, we have another great vision. Now what is interesting is that uh, Daniel has been in captivity in, in Babylon since he was a youth. Uh, he's getting old now, and he's reading in the prophet Jeremiah, and he reads about the fact that Jeremiah had predicted that this Babylonian captivity would only last for 70 years. And he's praying about uh, that, that, that and, and wanting to know, and, and he basically stands as, as, as a mediator for the nation of Israel and begins praying, confessing the sins of the nation, asking God to fulfill his promises that he has made. And so in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, we find that there is an angel who comes, the angel Gabriel, who comes to explain to Daniel what the future is going to hold. And again, it's important to notice what it says in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And so the focus of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, is upon Daniel's people, the Jews, and Daniel's holy city, the city of Jerusalem. And so these 70 weeks we believe to be not a seven-day week, uh, but the, the word that is translated week is the Hebrew heptad that simply means seven. So there are 70 sevens, and we believe that these are 70 sevens of years, a total of 490 years. And so in verse 24, six purposes are stated. Uh, for what's going to happen during this time. Uh, Christ's first coming, his first advent, provided the righteous basis for all six of these. Uh, and Christ's second advent will see all six fulfilled for the nation of Israel. And again, notice that it is the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem that is specifically being dealt with in this passage. So these uh, first three are to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Christ's death on the cross provided the righteous basis for those things to be offered to the nation of Israel. But when Christ comes again to establish his messianic kingdom, he will bring in everlasting righteousness, he will seal up vision and prophecy, and he will anoint the most holy. So we want to think a little bit about the timing and sequence of these 70 weeks that are prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. 
And we believe that the 70 weeks begins with a command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Again, that's what verse 25 says. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And so the first period is a period of seven weeks or 49 years. And then there will be a period of 62 weeks or 434 years. And then there is a gap. And there is still, we believe, outstanding one week, Daniel's 70th week, a period of seven years that has not yet been fulfilled. In between this, and it tells us that it's going to be after the 62 weeks. Now there's seven weeks and then 62 weeks. So after the 62 weeks or after the 69 weeks, but not during the 70th week, there are certain things that are going to happen. Verse 26 says, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And so the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem began in 444 BC and left went on until 395 BC. The 62 weeks, or the 69th week, ended with Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But then we have, after that triumphal entry, that the Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. He suffered for the sins of others upon the cross. And then in AD 70, the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy Jerusalem. And uh, Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus, uh, Roman general Titus, in AD 70. And so there is a gap between the 69th and the 70th week that has extended now for nearly 2,000 years. So we're also told in this passage in verse 27, then he, that is uh, the prince who is to come from the people that destroyed the city, so a Roman prince will someday come, and he will begin this final week. It says, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And so... During the 70th week, or the 70th week begins with this prince, this Roman prince, uh, signing a covenant with many, with the nation of Israel, uh, for, for a seven-year period. But in the middle of the week, he is going to cause sacrifices to cease, and then there will be much suffering until the final consummation. So again, Daniel has been given an insight into what is going to happen in the future days. Now, we also have, in Daniel chapter 11, quite a detailed prophecy of what was going to happen during this intertestamental period. And again, this will begin in the intertestamental period, but will also fast forward to the end times as well. So this is quite common in biblical prophecy, where you can have events that are laid side by side in a passage, and yet might have great time distances between them, the first coming and the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And so uh, we want to see uh, what Daniel chapter 11 teaches us about this intertestamental period. And so again, uh, we will learn about these empires that we've been seeing. Again, these are the same empires that have been spoken of in, uh, in Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 7 and in Daniel chapter 8, beginning in Daniel chapter 11 with the Medo-Persian Empire. And it tells us in verse 2, And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Uh, so the first one, after Darius the Mede, who's mentioned in verse 1, uh, is going to be Cambyses, and then Pseudo Smyrdas, and then Darius I, Histaspes, and then Xerxes the first, or Ahasuerus. Now again, these are not mentioned by name here. Again, they're just saying that there's going to be these four Medo-Persian rulers uh, up until the time of the Greek Empire. 
And so in the Greek Empire, it again is going to speak about a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted, even for others besides these. And so it was not Alexander the Great's children who ruled the great empire, but his empire, after a period of struggle, was eventually divided between his four generals into four parts. Two of those really have impact upon Israel and will be focused on in the rest of this chapter 11. And so we read about the kings of the south and the kings of the north. And these are, again, in relationship to Israel. The kings who are south of Israel and the kings who are north of Israel during this period of the Greek Empire. And so we'll read about these uh, kings of the south. And again, I'm not going to go into details. Again, they're not mentioned by name. But as historians have compared what Daniel 11 is speaking of with what they know from history, they're able to line up. And I'm just taking it from the commentators uh, who have done this research for us. Uh, so in the kings of the south, and again by the south, we are referring primarily to the Greek control of North Africa. Uh, so they were ruling in Egypt, and so we have cities like Alexandria in, in the north of, of Africa, uh, named after Alexander the Great. And these Ptolemies uh, were the rulers who were ruling primarily in the south. And in the north, uh, it's the Seleucid kings uh, who are reigning, and various names will come up here. So we have Ptolemy the uh, second, we have Antiochus the second, Ptolemy the third, Seleucus the second, Antiochus the third, Ptolemy fourth, Ptolemy fifth, Seleucus the fourth, and then Antiochus fourth Epiphanes, and Ptolemy six. Now again, just by looking at the number of verses given to each one of them, you will see that the greatest concentration of information here is given about Antiochus fourth Epiphanes. And so from verses 21 down to verse 35, the focus is going to be upon Antiochus Epiphanes, a man who had a great impact upon the city of Jerusalem and upon the nation of Israel. But in verse 36, it would appear that it moves from talking about Antiochus fourth Epiphanes and moves towards this end time view. And we believe that it is the Antichrist who is being described from verse 36 down to verse 45. And again, he is a Roman ruler, somehow related to the Roman Empire. I don't know how that's going to happen. We'll know and understand more when it happens. Uh, but again, recognize that in, in verse, we'll look at verse 29 of chapter 11. Again, this is focusing upon Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus had gone down into Egypt uh, to try and, and conquer Alexandria and take it for, for his empire. And it was actually a Roman representative who came to him and basically says, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, and Antiochus asked for time to think about it. And this Roman uh, senator took a stick and drew a circle around him and said, well, make a decision before you leave the circle. And so again, Antiochus realized he didn't have the strength as a, as a military army to deal with Rome because Rome's power was rising during this period. And so he went back, uh, back into Palestine, back into Syria and uh, dealt with issues there. But it says, for ships from Cyprus, verse 30, shall come against him Therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the Holy Covenant. Again, that's God's covenant with the nation of Israel, and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. So those who were Jewish and yet were forsaking the Holy Covenant, they were given favor by Antiochus. Verse 31, And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. And what we know again from history is that Antiochus Epiphanes went into that place, 
set up an altar to Zeus, sacrificed to Zeus in, in the, the temple in Jerusalem, and he tried to force Jewish believers in the one true God to worship Zeus and to eat the flesh of pigs. And because of their refusal to do that, Antiochus killed them. And so these were, were martyrs for their faith during that intertestamental period. But again, he refers here to the abomination of desolation, and that's something that the Lord Jesus will refer to in his prophetic discourses in, in, uh, in the New Testament. And so even though this section of Daniel chapter 11 has been fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes before the time of Christ, the Lord Jesus is still looking forward to a future time when there will be another abomination of desolation in the holy place. And he speaks about that in Matthew chapter 24. So, this period we can refer to, and the Lord Jesus referred to, as the times of the Gentiles. And what we want to recognize as we think about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, is that this is the times of the Gentiles, because really from 609 BC, when Nebuchadnezzar first came into, into Israel, um, from that point on, the rulers of Judah were always appointed by foreign powers, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. And, and so they were always under foreign domination. They had a measure for a while of independence, but still even that independence was granted to them by a foreign power. And none of those who sat on in, in authority in Israel from that time on was from the tribe of Judah, the royal tribe uh, that had been spoken of right from, from the times of, of Abraham, and sorry, from the time of, of uh, Jacob when he said that the tribe of Judah would be that royal tribe. So this period we refer to as the times of the Gentiles. The Gentiles are controlling and in many ways dominating the city of Jerusalem. So Solomon's temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. But then Babylon fell in 539 BC when Cyrus came in, killed Belshazzar, and took over Babylon and made it part of his Medo-Persian empire. Now this Cyrus was the same man who decreed the return of the Jews to Jerusalem in 538 BC. Now again, this had been predicted back before the fall of, of Jerusalem, probably about 150 years before Cyrus was even born. Isaiah the prophet had predicted that a man called Cyrus would be God's servant to bring the people back into the land. And so Cyrus decreed that in 538 BC. It's probably about 536 that the foundations of the temple were laid in Jerusalem. And so that begins the second temple period. Uh, it took about 20 years for the temple to be rebuilt. Uh, during that period, there was a lot of struggle and, and uh, difficulty in trying to bring it to pass. And then the, the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt under Nehemiah's command in 445 BC. And so the intertestamental period really begins then at the end of Malachi's ministry in 396 BC. Malachi is the last of the prophets. And so from 396 until the time of Christ, this is the 400 silent years uh, that we speak of. Now again, most of this then is not part of the intertestamental period because everything that we've been speaking about in this section already are things that other books, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, have spoken about already. But it was in 331 BC that Darius III was defeated, and he was defeated by Alexander the Great. And the, Alexander the Great was the head of the Greek Empire. He was this one who was like a leopard with wings on his back, who moved so fast across the ground and, and just conquered everything uh, in, in his way. And so this Times of the Gentiles, again, this intertestamental period in particular, focuses largely upon the Greek Empire and the start of the Roman Empire. While Alexander conquered the Medo-Persian Empire, he died in 323 BC at just 33 years of age. And after a period of struggle, his empire was divided amongst his four generals in 315 BC. The two kingdoms that have direct impact upon the nation of Israel is the Ptolemaic kingdom, the kings of the south, those, the Greek empire that was ruling 
North Africa and Egypt at that time, and they ruled Palestine from 315 to 198 BC. And then the Seleucid Kingdom, the kings of the north or of Syria, they ruled Palestine from 198 to 142 BC. And then we've sp spoken already about Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, the king of the north who desecrated the temple in 167 BC. That led to the Maccabean Revolt against the Seleucid Kingdom. And again, First and Second Maccabees are the books that you'll want to read to learn what was happening during this period. That's the historical record, or you can read Josephus's writing. Uh, Josephus, again, was a first century Jewish historian who tells us much about what was happening during this period. And then uh, from the family of the Maccabees, uh, actually the, the ancestor of Judas Maccabeus that we'll speak of, uh, he was a man called Hasmon, and so uh, his descendants who ruled Jerusalem and had this period of Jewish independence from 135 to 63 BC is known as the Hasmonean Kingdom, the descendants of Judas Maccabees. And then Pompey, again the blue is showing us that it's Rome, uh, Pompey was a, a Roman ruler who took Syria from Seleucid control as well as taking charge of Judea in 63 BC. So you've moved from the Babylonian to the Medo-Persian to the Greek and now to the Roman Empire. The times of the Gentiles are then continuing. So we know a little bit again about Rome, uh, not so much again from the from even from the Maccabees, but from what we learn in history and a little bit what we learn in the New Testament as well. Uh, but the Roman Senate uh, had ruled from 509 to 27 BC. Now again, they were not a world empire under the senators. Uh, again, they were largely dealing with things in Italy and maybe some things in, in Macedonia. Uh, but as their power grew, they started to stretch out towards the east and, and down towards the south into Egypt. So the Roman Senate was replaced by the Roman Empire, and that lasted from 27 BC until 395 AD. Julius Caesar, a well-known name, he reigned as dictator from 49 to 44 BC when he was assassinated. And then Herod the Great, that we read about in the New Testament and the Gospels, he was not a Jew, uh, he was an Idumean, uh, another local uh, group, uh, and he was appointed as king of the Jews by Rome in 37 BC. So again, Israel does not have control over who it's establishing as their as their rulers and governors and their kings, and Herod is given the title King of the Jews by Rome in 37 BC. And that's why Herod was obviously troubled when the wise men came to him in Matthew chapter 2 and said, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Octavian uh, was the one who reigned as emperor from 27 BC until 14 AD, and he takes the title Augustus Caesar. And so again, in the birth narratives of the Lord Jesus, we read about uh, Augustus Caesar uh, making a decree that everyone should return to their home place. Uh, and, and so Mary and Joseph they had to travel to Bethlehem and made sure that the Lord Jesus was born there and fulfilled the prophecies given in the Old Testament in Micah chapter 5. Well, Herod began a lot of reconstruction work and a lot of enlargement uh, and he enlarged the temple beginning in 20 BC, still going on uh, during the time of the Lord Jesus. And then Jesus is born in probably 4 or 5 BC, and Herod the Great dies in 4 BC. Now, again, when we hear the expression BC, we think of before Christ, and we wonder how could Christ be born 4 or 5 before Christ. Uh, again, when the calendar was established as that we use today. Uh, there was a miscalculation that was made and now because of uh, further research and understanding we realize that uh, the Lord Jesus wasn't born in the year zero. Uh, he was he was probably born four or five BC because he was still alive uh, or Herod was still alive when the Lord Jesus was born and we know from history that he died in four BC. And then General Titus was the one we mentioned already. He came and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70 and brings to an end this second temple period, as it's often referred to. 
So one of the things that we have to think about, particularly during this period of the Greek Empire, is the issue of Hellenization, the challenge of Hellenization. And Hellenization is the term used for the spread of Greek culture, religion, and language throughout the Greek Empire. It made it possible for people to be able to communicate and do commerce and to travel widely because Koine, common Greek, became the dominant language of the empire and lasted for centuries even after the empire fell. Our New Testament would have been written in Koine Greek. As a result, the Hebrew scriptures were also translated into Greek, probably in Alexandria, Egypt, um, and, and in what is now known as the Septuagint, abbreviated as LXX. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, but there were major negative impacts that came through Hellenization. Much like today, their call for religious toleration in the Greek Empire left no, no room for worship of the one true God. This was particularly seen during the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes of the Seleucid, the northern the Syrian kingdom and its impact upon uh, Jerusalem and upon Judea. But sadly, there were Jewish high priests who sought to accommodate this Hellenization. Uh, there was a man called Jason, actually his name was Joshua, but he took a Greek name instead of his Hebrew name. His father, Onias III, had been a devout and godly leader, uh, but Jason was appointed in his place and tried to bring in uh, some of this Hellenization, uh, encouraging the Greek language, Greek culture. Uh, he built a gymnasium to, to teach uh, people in Jerusalem how to conduct themselves uh, like a Greek uh, would and learn the Greek language and all of these influences he brought to bear. But there was a man called Menelaus who was a Benjamite and he was dissatisfied with the rate of change under Jason and he bribed Antiochus IV to give him the priesthood instead. So even though he's not from the Levitical tribe, uh, he paid money to Antiochus and he became the priest and the ruler over Jerusalem at that time. Eventually Jason, who had been banished or had to run away, he, he raised an army to attack Menelaus, uh, but Antiochus came to his aid and uh, Jason was repelled at that time. Well, this leads to the Maccabean revolt from 167 to 134. Antiochus decided that he needed to unite his kingdom and he was going to do it through religion and attempted to force the Jews to worship Zeus and to eat the flesh of pigs. He also banned circumcision and the reading of the Hebrew scriptures. But Mattathias, he was a priest of the family of Hasmon, the Hasmoneans, uh, he was committed to covenant faithfulness. And with his sons, he began to oppose Menelaus and Antiochus. Uh, and much of this was through uh, guerrilla warfare, uh, short little attacks from the hills uh, coming in and, and causing havoc throughout Seleucid Empire, really. And when Mattathias died, he appointed his son Judas as commander of this rebel army. And Judas became known as Judas Maccabees, or the Hammer, or Hammerer, uh, because of his great accomplishments in fighting against Antiochus. Initially, uh, Ma uh, Mattathias and Judas, they would have focused on cleansing the land of these pagan altars. They would smash them to pieces. Uh, they would bring try and bring these Hellenized Jews back to covenant faithfulness, even forcibly circumcising their sons who had not been circumcised. Eventually, Judas Maccabees attacked Jerusalem, and Menelaus had to flee. Uh, Judas then cleansed the temple. He erected a new altar to Yahweh, and this occurred on the 25th of Kislev, or December we would call it, in 164 BC, and has ever since been celebrated as the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah, also known as the Feast of Lights. Uh, when Judas died, his brothers took over, first Jonathan, the youngest of the brothers, and later Simon. Uh, by that time he was quite an elderly man, uh, but he took over, reigning over Jerusalem. And it was really through Simon that he was able to negotiate terms of peace with Trypho, the first Syrian king not of Seleucid descent. And so the Hasmonean kingdom allowed them to have a degree of independence, again, given to them by a Syrian king, uh, not something that they achieved really through through uh, covenant faithfulness even, 
uh, but through this negotiating that had taken place. As a result, the leaders in Israel appointed Simon and his descendants to be leader and high priest forever, even though they were not from the Aaronic line, the line of Aaron and the Levites. And when Simon was murdered by his son-in-law, then his son, Simon's son, John Hyrcanus, became head of the Hasmonean dynasty. And so from 135 until 63, uh, various of these uh, sons of Hyrcanus and grandsons, uh, and all of them tracing back to Hasmon, uh, would have been the rulers of Israel during this period. Now there were, in addition to these political developments that were taking place at this time, there were a number of significant religious developments that took place as well. Uh, the Septuagint, we've mentioned already, the translation of the Old Testament into Greek, and that Greek Septuagint was read in the early church, often quoted by New Testament writers. Uh, the Septuagint often is represented by the Roman numerals LXX. L stands for 50 and X stands for 10. You add them together, you get 70. And according to Philo, Josephus, the letter of Aristius and rabbinic sources, King Ptolemy of Philadelphia assembled 70 or possibly 72 translators to render the law of Moses into Greek. So in its most limited sense, Septuagint refers just to this project which covered the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Um, oftentimes people refer to the Septuagint as referring to the entire Greek Old Testament, uh, but the original thing was just the, the law of Moses. Also during this period, the synagogue came into being. Uh, again, a place for assembly and worship that developed in Jewish communities throughout the Mediterranean in the late centuries before Christ. By about 300 BC, a large community of Jews lived in Alexandria, Egypt. A marble slab found near Alexandria bears an inscription dedicating the synagogue to Ptolemy III, who ruled Egypt from 246 to 220 BC, and his queen Berenice. This is the first solid evidence of a true synagogue. Within Palestine, one of the oldest known synagogues is the one uncovered on Masada, near the Dead Sea, built in the first century BC. It was also during this time that the scribes came to exist as a, a class of people. Uh, after the Jews returned from the captivity in Babylon, the era of the scribes began. The reading of the law before the nation of Israel by Ezra, recorded in Nehemiah 8-10, to signaled the nation's return to exact observance of all the laws and rites that had been given. Following the law and the traditions that had grown up around it became the measure of devotion and spirituality. Now again, that was challenged by this process of Hellenization, uh, but during the days of Ezra, uh, that had, had become re-established. At first, the priests were responsible for the scientific study and professional communication of this legal code, but this function eventually passed to the scribes. Their official interpretation of the meaning of the law eventually became more important than the law itself. We also have the Pharisees rise to prominence during this period, and obviously they are very dominant during the days of the Gospels, during the life of Christ, uh, but it was during this intertestamental period that the Pharisees came into existence. They had their roots in a group of faithful Jews known as the Hasidim, or Kassidim. Uh, the Hasidim rose in the second century BC when the influence of Hellenism on the Jews was particularly strong, and many Jews lived little differently than their Gentile neighbors, but the Hasidim insisted on strict observance of Jewish ritual laws. And even today, in various parts, you will find Hasidic Jews who try and follow the law closely. Apparently, from this movement of faithful Hasidim came both the Essenes, who later broke off from other Jews and formed their own desert communities largely, and the Pharisees, who remained an active part of Jewish life. The Essenes, uh, were, are not mentioned in either the Old Testament or the New Testament, but we, we do know of them from Jewish history. And they are a Jewish religious group, group of the Second Temple period that emerged and flourished in Palestine from the 2nd century BC to the 1st century AD. The Essenes are often connected with the Jewish sectarian community known from the Dead Sea Scrolls and are the ones who would have gathered uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then there were the Herodians. Uh, again, obviously rising from the time of, uh, of Herod the Great, 
who came to power in 37 BC. They were a Jewish political party who sympathized with the Herodian rulers from Rome. They were at one with the Sadducees in holding the duty of submission to Rome and of supporting the Herods on the throne. Now, again, there's quite a bit of debate about the, the Sadducees uh, and exactly how they developed, and so we haven't dealt with them uh, specifically here. So, we have to ask again, what is the significance of this era? What are the things that we should really take away from our study today? Well, first of all, this period of Jewish history is not directly recorded in Scripture, but it does help us to understand the spiritual and political climate into which the Lord Jesus was born and in which the church was birthed. And it reminds us as well that even when God was not speaking through his people, he was still caring for his chosen people. Now, our next two sessions uh, will be dealing with the history or the historical period of the New Testament, uh, the period of Christ and the period of the church. And we hope you'll be able to join us uh, for that part of our series.